is Laura London, and you're listening to Speaking of Jung. Returning to the podcast for episode 86 is Jungian analyst and author Anne Casement in London, England. She attended the Sorbonne in Paris and the London School of Economics, where she earned her degree in physical and social anthropology, and later trained as a Jungian analyst in London. Professor Casement is an honorary professor at the Oriental Academy for Analytical Psychology, a senior member of the British Jungian Analytic Association, an associate member of the Jungian Psychoanalytic Association in New York, is a New York State licensed psychoanalyst, a member of the British Psychoanalytic Council, the National Association for the Advancement of Psychoanalysis, and the British Psychological Society. She is also a founding member of the International Neuropsychoanalysis Association and patron of the Freud Museum in London. She worked in the field of psychiatry for several years, chaired the UK Council for Psychotherapy, served on the Executive Committee of the International Association for Analytical Psychology and the IAAP Ethics Committee, becoming its chair in 2010. From 1999 to 2001, she conducted research working with Lord Alderdice and other stakeholders in the profession on a private member's bill in the House of Lords on the statutory regulation of the psychotherapy psychoanalytic profession. Since 2015, she has been teaching and lecturing in China at the initial invitation of Professor He Yong Shen. Professor Casement has lectured and taught in many additional countries around the world, including Japan, Russia, the United States, Canada, Israel, Lithuania, Switzerland, South Africa, Brazil, Mexico, and in several countries in Europe. She contributes to The Economist and to psychoanalytic journals worldwide. She served on the Gradiva Awards Committee in 2013, delivered the Fay Lecture at Texas A&M in 2019, is a fellow of the Royal Anthropological Institute, a fellow of the Royal Society of Medicine, and was a member of the Council of the Metropolitan Opera in New York. She is the editor of Post-Jungians Today, Key Papers in Contemporary Analytical Psychology, Who Owns Psychoanalysis, and Who Owns Jung. She is co-editor of The Idea of the Numinous, Contemporary Jungian and Psychoanalytic Perspectives with David Tacey, and Thresholds and Pathways Between Jung and Lacan, on The Blazing Sublime, with Phil Goss and Danny Nobis. She is the author of Carl Gustav Jung, the first edition in the Key Figures in Counseling and Psychotherapy series from Sage Publications, and the newly released Jung, An Introduction, published by Phoenix House on April 30th, and it is the subject of our talk today. Please visit the website speakingofjung.com where you will find links to everything discussed in this episode in the show notes. This interview is being recorded on Wednesday, May 5th, 2021, through the magic of Skype. It is my pleasure to have you back for another episode, Professor Casement. Welcome. Oh, hello, Laura. It's so good to be talking to you again. I thoroughly enjoyed our last long uh a conversation that we had on Skype. Yes, we talked a little bit about this book in our previous discussion. It was episode 51. We recorded it on December 2nd, 2019. And at that time, the book was tentatively titled The Analyst's Guide to Jung. It was published as Jung and Introduction last week on April 30th by Phoenix Publishing House. Uh, You can find them at firingthemind.com. So would you tell us a little bit about how the book came to be? Yes, that would give me a lot of pleasure because um, um, I met these two young publishers, Kate Pierce and Fernando Marquez, at a lavish birthday, 80th birthday party for Stella Weldon, um, Professor Stella Weldon, who's a, a very highly thought of psychoanalyst in London. Um, she's originally actually from uh, Argentine. Um, and this was at the Freud Museum, uh, where I love going. 
And these two young um, people approached me and uh, they seemed to know me from, uh, because they had worked very at, at uh, Karnak Books with my great friend um, Oliver Rathbone. Uh, and then they, when Oliver sold the publishing arm of Karnak uh, to Routledge, um, uh, Kate and Fernando, uh, I think very enterprisingly, have set up their own publishing house, which they call Phoenix. Um, and interesting enough, I'd just done a presentation in um, Yokohama. Um, I think it was just prior to meeting uh, Kate and Fernando at the Freud Museum. I'd just done a, 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 a keynote address on the phoenix um, uh, to, much to my amazement, um, a huge audience of nearly a thousand people. I think that's the largest live audience that I've ever addressed. And I, I did a lot of research on that and going actually to um, Beirut in parts of the Lebanon, because that, of course, is where Phoenix originates from the Phoenician um, civilization. Um, and that was a great adventure because obviously everyone is um, taking a certain risk going to a country like that. Sure. But it was, it, it was so interesting for me then to have these two young people who told me that they had... Um, set up this new publishing house called Phoenix, and they're publishing some um, some of the top um, psychoanalysts, um, you know, already. They've yeah. got, um, my great friend Brett Carr was one of their first uh, authors they published. Uh, John Sklar from the British Psychoanalytic Society I worked very closely with at one time. Um, Colleen Covington, of course, who's a friend and colleague uh, from the Society of Analytical Psychology and so on. That's wonderful. So this book you were writing the uh, last time we spoke, and the working title changed from The Analyst's Guide to Jung to Jung and Introduction. So I was looking through it, and Phoenix was kind enough to send me an, ad an advanced copy, and it is wonderful. It is 20 chapters. And the question I get asked the most is, I'm new to Jung, where should I begin? And this book, I would definitely recommend as a starting point, because you cover everything. And it is balanced, I would say. Uh, yes, there is, uh, as you had mentioned to me, a lot of you in this book, but I love that because, and you even mentioned this, that the book represents your own ideas that have developed about psychoanalysis over more than 55 years. And there's nothing I love more than experience. Oh, well, nice to hear that. Yes, it, 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 it's, uh, it, it's, of course, me, but very much embedded in psychoanalysis. I'm not talking about me as a person, which wouldn't be of much interest to anyone, apart from myself, I suppose, and you know, a few close members of uh, my uh, country of family and friends. Um, but yes, I, and, and it's a, such a different book uh, to a, a book I did over 20 years ago, which was, um, uh, that was uh, commissioned by uh, Sage, by Wendy Dryden, who's a sort of overall editor of Sage, a very well-known figure in the um, behavioral and cognitive world. Uh, and that was just called Carl Gustav Jung. Um, and so this one, although I do cover some of the essentials, you know, like archetypes and unconscious, collective unconscious. Um, it, it, this is a totally different book. So it was it, it's so interesting for me, uh, to, 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 in a way, to see how my own path had uh, developed in those 20 odd years. And you say that the book is dedicated to truth. 
I love that. Why did you dedicate it to truth? Because without truth, I don't know that any, anything of real worth exists. Mm -hmm. For me, that's the fundamental. Um, and it, I was wondering whether I would dedicate it to anyone or anything as I went along. And slowly, um, that is what constellated was that this is above all what my life is in service to mm. is tr truth. And what I mean by truth is that in every situation, and I'm, I, th this comes out of my own experience, experience as a, an analyst particularly, in every situation there is tr there's a truth at the core of it. And this is what one is looking for. This is the goal one is aiming at with every analysis and patient that one works with. Um, and and, and this is there for all each of us in our own lives. And so it seemed to me, it, it, it just came to me as I was working on the book that this is actually what what my life has uh, really been about. As I said, the book is 20 chapters, and you start at the beginning. Uh, the first chapter is titled Early Life, and you talk about who, who he was, who he was as a child, his parents, um, how his mother suffered from mental illness, and his, his, his parents had a very unhappy relationship. And then something else I found interesting is you point out how often he uses the word defeat in relation to the things he did not excel in. And so it's just, to me, Jung was one of the greatest thinkers of our lifetimes. And so to, to see the, the early life, a, a great picture of what he came from and how he became who he became, uh, I thought that that chapter really set the stage. Um, yes, I don't honestly think one can uh, write a book about anybody um, without giving some biography. I don't think one has to you know, go into huge detail because there's a, a lot on Jung around already. Uh, so many people have written about him. But I felt it was important just, as you say, to set the stage. And uh, if I might mention, I've been asked to contribute a chapter um, uh, for a new book that um, it, 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 a Jungian psychoanalyst called Stefano Capani is putting together, and it's it's um, uh, the living ancestors. So, <laughs> I don't know. I know John Beebe's in it, and um, that's about all I do know. But uh, he's gathered together, I, I think, a group of us who are of a certain um, age. A certain stage in our lives, and he wants each of us to uh, uh, to contribute chapters to that. So that I've done already. But then he asked me if, um, as you know, you were there when uh, Sonu did that um, webinar on um, the Black Books a few months ago. Yes, it was wonderful. As you mentioned to me that you were there. And I asked a question there, which was um, because Sonu mentioned uh, both shadow and anima, and it struck me that there is a, a sense, a very strong link between these two uh, enormously important contributions of Jung's to psychology. They're hugely important, both of them, in my estimation. And and I wondered about the um, the, sh the shadow of, of those because shadow for me is such a, an all important topic. I've I've written about and and my book I'm editing at the moment is dedicated to shadow, to Jung's concept notion of shadow. Um, 
And so then Stefano, having sent my that chapter for the author, Ancestors book, then Stefano asked me, because he must have heard that, that webinar, I think it was Sonu did, he asked if I would write something, a chapter for another book he's putting together on um, uh, linking anima and shadow and how that, um, how Jung's concept of anima um, uh, would have developed out of his early childhood and childhood deprivation specifically. And what I've drafted so far, and I, I, that's, uh, I'm not going to work on really just yet, but I just have to send him a draft of it, is I've actually diagnosed Jung's mother, which I know is, is considered extremely <laughs> unprofessional to do, but she has all the symptoms of a certain disorder. And so I'm going to stick my neck out and say, this is what I, I you know, in my experience, it's, it's what I, I think that, uh, uh, I've forgotten the name for a moment, but anyway, uh, Frau Jung suffered from. And, and show and make some link there to some of Jung's pathology. Um, and also the, the development of anima, which is to some extent based on, on his experience with mother. But I'm also going to mention, uh, you know, father, the relationship with father, which is also hugely important, as we know. And I think I do something on that in my Jung and Introduction book on how that, uh, particularly the relationship with Freud, how that was um, affected by his, Jung's relationship, un very unsatisfactory on the whole relationship with his um, personal father. Yes, and uh, you had mentioned that there are other biographies of Jung out there. Uh, it's been written about a lot, but why I love this one is because, as I said, of your long experience in the field and with knowing personally Jung's grandsons and the people who who knew Jung, like Hillman and Fordham and Adler, and you, uh, you so you, when it's coming from you, it means more, and that's how I feel about it. So it's interesting you mentioned the relationship between shadow and anima, because when we get to it, uh, chapter five is titled Shadow and Persona, and you do deal with the anima, the animus in there, and I was wondering how they were involved with shadow and persona, um, but it makes sense after reading it, and then the following chapter, chapter six, is on the anima and the anima. So Backing up, just to go in order here, the second chapter is titled Psychiatry, and it's about Jung's decision to go into the medical field and to become a psychiatrist. And that is something that is very important to you, because you worked in that field as well. Yes, or indeed I did. And I, I grew to love it so much. Um, both um, the patients but also the consultants that I was so fortunate to work with. Um, they was, um, the psychiatry tends to get a rather negative transference from society at large. Yes. Um, but actually, the work it does, and many, by certainly all the psychiatrists I've met, and certainly, most definitely, the psychiatrists I've worked very closely with in the years that I was at that hospital, are so dedicated to their patients. Um, I, I can't tell you. I, I, I was completely won over by them. But also the work itself is utterly fascinating. Um, uh, I, I, I was, um, I, I got on so well, and I think my, I, I, th I think I mentioned in that chapter that um, uh, the, cons the the consultants wanted me to stay on, and uh, actually offered me a consultancy because the work I was doing alongside the medication that each of these patients uh, needed. I mean, they actually needed that medication. Uh, because one's working with, you know, psychosis and, uh, and serious, you know, serious disorders. 
um, it was uh, saving the National Health Service money because uh, it was helping to keep these patients as outpatients. Because it costs a great deal more you know, for all these reasons. If you, you know, if they have to, if they have to come in, and of course, from time to time, they they would have to come in. Um, but it is, um, I. I became so engrossed in, in psychiatry that I, realized, I began to realize after a few years that I, I might well stay there because it was taking me over. Um, and I, I then had to come, you know, as, as one does in life, one comes to a crossroads and one has to make difficult choices. And I realized that Actually, my calling, as James Hillman always referred to it, he always talked of the calling, mm -hmm. vocation. Um, my calling was as a psychoanalyst, not as a psychotherapist uh, working with psychosis. Um, so I had to very sadly leave psychiatry and, and start to build up my psychoanalytic practice. Um, which was a real, that was a wrench. I still miss it, actually, curiously. Of course, I couldn't take any of the patients except one uh, because one does need a backup if you're working with uh, psychosis. It, it, it would be completely irresponsible to work with those kind of patients in, in one's you know, private practice. And I work from home, as many of us do, and so I had to, uh, you know, bid farewell to my patients there. One of whom I did, in a sense, stalk me for quite a while. Oh. Um, because she she couldn't let go. Um, she abused me absolutely the whole time we worked together. But once I left, um, it was very interesting. She then... Until she, you know, she couldn't kind of continue without seeing me. And I kept explaining to her that I couldn't see her as a private patient. I mean, she had the wherewithal because she came from a very, um, you know, substantial background. Uh, but that I, I, I really do, you know, that was my policy not to see anyone um, from psychiatry as a private patient, except one who was uh, I worked with for many, many years after I left psychiatry, and that was absolutely feasible because he wasn't psychotic. You mention in that chapter, you say it is essential for a psychoanalyst to have experience of working in psychiatry. Oh, I, I completely, completely subscribe to that mm -hmm. um, because you need to know what it is you're dealing with as a psychoanalyst and as a psychotherapist and as a counselor, quite honestly. Mm -hmm. um, you know, counselors do extraordinarily uh, good work. Um, and I could talk for quite some time on that because I, I incorporate actually quite a lot from other um, other disciplines in the way that I function. Uh, and, of course, psychiatry, partly because of my experience of working in psychiatry, where one's interacting, you know, with clinical psychologists, with behaviorists, with um, psychotherapists from other disciplines. Um, and... Um, so yes, that's really essential because if you are, if you realize that someone is actually psychotic, mm -hmm. um, then it's, it, you, you know what to do, um, you know, in terms of medication. In, in the UK, I'm not, I don't know if you want me to talk a bit about this because it's rather going off on a tangent, but in the UK, um, one doesn't automatically refer a patient to a psychiatrist if they're having a psychotic episode. Um, they, they, you know, they, you send them to their general practitioner who um, will prescribe the necessary medication, will do a diagnosis and prescribe, and, and of course you will have sent your own diagnosis. Um, 
it's it's where a patient anyone can have a psychotic episode. Mm-hmm. It's absolutely, you know, that's absolutely true. But if you realise that some that a patient is psychotic, then you know what you should do about it. Because I think if it, there have been instances where analysts working in their private practices have been attacked physically by psychotic patients. Moving on to the next chapter, it is titled Freud, and it is about Jung's relationship with Freud uh, from beginning to end, and it's quite a long chapter, and it is a great uh, summation of of that relationship. And in it, uh, you mentioned that Jung's lifelong quest was to found an interdisciplinary psychology of complexities, one that would encompass all human functioning. And that is really why I love Jung and his psychology, is because it encompasses everything. And that he thought of calling his own discipline complex psychology uh, after his split with Freud. Would you say a little bit about that? Yes. Um, I have, interesting enough, I've done in my um, sh- uh, shadow, the, I, I did the Fay lectures in Houston uh, last, in November 2019. And so Texas A&M then wanted to publish a book of those papers. So I'm just editing all that right now. And one of the chapters actually is where I go into that in depth, where I'm looking at... Um, because of course, this introduction book is 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 just that. So I can't, you know, elaborate at great length on any of the topics that I cover in the book. Um, and um, sorry, I lost my thread there for a moment. That's okay. Talking. I I've been greatly looking forward to the publication of of that book based on your Fay lecture series on the shadow. That is initially why I had invited you to do an episode uh, back in 2019. And I noticed that Texas A&M publishes those Fay lectures as books. And so I've been awaiting that with great anticipation. Do you know when that will be published? Um, well, that, I'm just editing with a, 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 I must say, really wonderful editor called Sean Fitzpatrick. Um, we're, we're, we're editing right now, so this will depend on, you know, he's a busy man and I'm busy here in London. Uh, and so we, you know, we're, we're fitting in our editing, um, our joint editing as and when around our busy schedules. Sure. Uh, so one of the chapters for that is on what I think I've had it is um, I write all the time so I can guess if it mixed up uh, which which bit of, or or paper I'm referring to but one of the chapters is actually about that um, and I've I'm just trying to remember what I've titled that one um, it's complex psychology versus the anthropological gaze, oh. I think. <laughs> I think that's what it's called. Mm-hmm. And I look there at uh, in more depth, rather critically, I'd have to say, about Jung's attempt to bring um, all these disciplines, you know, under the same umbrella, mm-hmm. uh, under the umbrella of psychology, actually, I think was what his plan, what his uh, vision was. Um, and and I then um, critique uh, some of his uh, borrowings from some of the other social sciences because my background, is, as you mentioned earlier, is in uh, um, anthropology. Um, and I go into that in quite some length. And I actually, you know, I'm saying this is why he couldn't bring it off, basically. Um, but I, and I also wonder in in that chapter. I don't think I do it in the introduction book. I wonder what it was that drove Jung to 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 aspire to that. I it, I, I, I conjecture that it. I wondered whether he was trying to heal the split that, after all, he caused, you know, in psychoanalysis itself. Yeah. 
Uh, that just uh, passing. Uh, that's a passing conjecture on my part, but um, um, because you know, to try and bring these, each of these disciplines has libraries full of you know literature. Right. They've generated enormous amounts of research and writings, and to 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 have some kind of vision of bringing them all together in some way is it seems to me is wildly uh, aspirational. Although I then actually go on to say that they, that ha has happened um, since uh, the late 1940s under the heading of cybernetics. Mm. I, I say a little bit about that, I think, in, in uh, somewhere, <laughs> one of the things I'm writing, because I, I'm, I've become very interested in that. If someone I'm very close to is doing research in uh, AI and machine learning and is tutoring me. I'm having tutorials every week on basic on cybernetics, and I'm becoming really, really fascinated by that. Um, and that actually, I think, has come as close as any anything can to bringing together the sciences and the social sciences in this extraordinary way. Um, I mean, from anthropology, for instance, Margaret Mead, uh, from the sciences, Norbert Wiener, uh, anyone you can think of, Shannon, all the great names from AI and machine learning. Um, uh, you know, they all kind of come under this broad heading of cybernetics, and that I find terribly exciting. So, simultaneously, you know how life brings you things at uh, the right moments, so to speak. Yes. Uh, and so, at the same time that I, I was critiquing Jung's, you know, psychology of complexities, suddenly um, cybernetics comes into my life, and I think, oh, well, here's here's a vision that actually, to a large extent, did come off. That's so interesting. Uh, and I would love to speak with you in the future about AI, because that has recently entered my life as well. And I'm very interested in that. So the next chapter is on archetypes in the collective unconscious. And I've heard you mention that you consider yourself a part of the archetypal school. And I would like to ask you, uh, whenever I mention Jung to people who are not very familiar with him, they immediately think of archetypes and they want to talk about archetypes. And that is just not my dish. So how would you define an archetype and, and what is the role of the archetype in Jung's psychology? Um, it's what Sonu calls one of his signature concepts, um, and what I did in the in that chapter was to put it together with the collective unconscious. Um, now I could speak the rest of our time together on you know what inspired his uh, notion of archetypes, of, uh, which I, I think I spell out a little bit in the book. Mm -hmm. um, he's very he takes he, he's um, He's taking from everywhere. You know, that's, that's a wonderful thing about Jung. It's also, it's also what I critique him for. Uh, you know, the, the, everything in life is paradoxical, isn't it? And, uh, the, you know, I'm good for him for, for doing that. At the same time, he, I, I critique some of the sources he turns to, but, but not on archetypes. I, I'm all, I, I'm absolutely with him on, you know, where he's, where he's looking for inspiration. Obviously, originally from Plato, Plato's forms, those are, you know, there they are already for him. And he is, I would say, more Plato than Aristotle, although Aristotle is, in my estimation, as great as Plato informing our thinking uh, over the centuries. Um, that's another discussion. Um, so he's, he, what he's looking for, I suppose, are what might, people sometimes call the eternal verities. You know, what, are there things that are fundamental in us, in human existence? I, I, I think that's really what, what he's after, and that's what Plato's after. 
And so he goes to Plato first. He then um, turns to, uh, of course, uh, perhaps the greatest of the um, modern or uh, early modern philosophers, and that's Kant. And he's taking enormous amounts from Kant's thinking um, on the phenomenal and the numeral. Uh, again, we could talk the whole time on, on just that. But uh, um, so, and both Plato, well, Plato, Socrates, and Aristotle have held tremendous, um, uh, I, I, I have, you know, since I was very young, I was drawn to their thinking. Um, and Kant, I came to much later, um, really uh, through a Jungian, not so much through Jung himself, and that is Giegrich, who's had a hugely important impact on my life for many years now. Um, I, I think that's, it, it, it's, it's what I've dedicated the book to, and I think this is actually what Jung is after as well, it's kind of eternal truths. And and this is, you know, it's not everybody's dish. I quite agree, um, uh, thinking in that way, but that's what what I think he's after, and and I and I and to a large extent I subscribe to that. Um, and without that, I, I mean, I call myself a developmental archetypal psychoanalyst. Mm -hmm. Insofar so far as I put any labels on myself, usually I just say I'm a psychoanalyst. Right. I don't. I don't put labels on myself on this. Um, but also being uh, coming under uh, later in my life under the influence of two um, hugely charismatic figures, and that was uh, Wolfgang Giebrich and, um, of course, James Hillman, mm -hmm. who is the founder, as you know, of archetypal psychology. Yes. The following chapter is on shadow and persona, and I know we've spoken uh, a bit about about shadow in the previous episode. Is there anything that you would like to add here? I don't want to take too much of your time, so I think probably um, it's in, in just in in one line. I think mm -hmm. Jung summarizes it so well: it's everything we have no wish to be, <laughs> basically we don't want to know about. Um, is there? We know that the trickster, and the, the longer I live, the more aware I am of how that trickster dogs one's footsteps throughout life. <laughs> it's, it's, it's just there. And um, trickster and shadow, to quite extent, an extent I would say synonymous, and, and shadow and unconscious are to a large extent synonymous. Um, so I've, I've written so, and lectured so often on shadow and different manifestations of shadow. Persona, I, I, it always seems to me it's been rather neglected uh, by psychoanalysts because they tend to see it as perhaps rather superficial, maybe belonging more on the kind of behavioral, in behavioral psychology. But in fact, the what the one the text that I reference is which is from a great friend of mine who died about five years ago and she she used to talk to me so often about wanting to write about persona and she eventually started to do that when she knew that she was under a death sentence um, and I think she's done such a wonderful job of it and so I think I as, as, as far as I can remember in the book I think I base persona very much on uh, Elaine's work and that's kind of dedication as well to Elaine. Oh, nice. And then how do the anima and animus fit in here? Yeah, wow, you are a taskmaster. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, yeah, I mean, again, I, I think that anima particularly is is such a huge contribution to to psychology from Jung. I, 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 um, I, again, I could say so much about it. It's, it. it seems to me that 
he, he, the way he writes about Animal shifts quite markedly, depending on where he is in his own life, and is, I'm sure, related. As you know, he had quite a lot of relationships with women. Yes. That, different sorts, um, including erotic ones. And I think depending on where he was in his uh, emotional life, Anima takes on different aspects. Um, and the person whose work I admire most on Anima Animus is uh, Professor Verena Kast, mm -hmm. who is one of the women that I select as, you know, one of the inspiring women in the um, analytical psychology world that yes. comes through in the books. But her, her, she's done wonderful research on animal animus. So I, I think I reference that quite a bit in my... I like how you, you point out that it's interesting that Jung said that males readily accept the anima when she appears in a novel or as a film star, such as Marilyn Monroe, but it's a different matter when it came to understanding the role that she played in a man's personal life in the form of projecting the anima onto the mother, the wife, the sister, the daughter. And similarly, uh, the other way around for a female who secretly hoped to be rescued by a man. Um, but the only way to be released from you say from this obsessional behavior is for males and females to become aware of the unconscious influence on the way this archetypal anima animus influences the way that they conduct their lives, or I should say the way we conduct our lives. Uh, so that is something to be considered and is discussed in this chapter at length. And the next chapter is on the puer puella versus narcissism. Yes, yes. yes. I, I enjoy doing that one um, very much. I well, I enjoy doing the whole book, actually. Yeah. Really, it was a labor of love. It, uh, you know, one uses that phrase sometimes. Uh, mm -hmm. Well, it, it shows. It, but it, this one, this book was a real labor of love. I absolutely loved writing it. Um, I, it, there's so much of me in it in that way, you know, that it's uh, my love for Jung and for analytical psychology and for psychoanalysis, I think, is, is, uh, is, is what drove it. I took more notes on this chapter. I've just, I just noticed right, right. Looking through my notes yeah, than yeah. any of the other chapters. And something interesting about the Puer Puella, which is uh, eternal youth of either sex and how it manifests positively is as a creative force. But the way that it can manifest negatively is the inability for one to mature. Mm, sure. That's a very good summary. Yeah. And how does narcissism tie into this? Well, narcissism, Jung, I think I mentioned in the book that Jung only used the term narcissism or something like narcissism very early on when he's still a Freudian because he, he develops his own theory of poor Puella, which are, as you know, the Latin for boy and girl. And um, um, Freud... Freud wrote, wrote copiously on narcissism. Uh, one of the meta one of the great metapsychology papers is on narcissism, um, and is negative. In fact, Freud would not work with narcissistic patients uh, because he thought psychoanalysis was, was not um, applicable. It, it was appropriate treatment for narcissism because, as in his view, narcissistic patients could not form a transference because all the libido is going inwards. There's no libido available to project onto, you know, onto the analyst and therefore form transference, negative, positive, or, or whatever. Um, and he held to that view throughout and therefore he never worked with narcissistic patients or, or with psychosis. Um, Jung has a rather different, uh, he, he, Puella, Puella has some relationship to narcissism, um, but it, he has, as so often with Jung, there's something 
creative there as well, and particularly I think with Puella because the, this is there throughout life, and it, it's the, our creative force really. And if we so, if you're working, this is a very I I supervise so many um, cases of uh, you know of analysts or. or training candidates working with um, uh, patients that we would call poor or poor ally. Um, and what we're looking at is that we're not trying to get rid of that in the patients, but we're trying to ground it so that the so ego can develop and mature and you get, you know, mature personality, but still with that boy or girl uh, in them, you know, because, you know, I still have a lot of my adolescent side in me and I and I treasure that. I cherish it. I wouldn't be without that for anything. Mm -hmm. uh, I never know when it's suddenly going to make, manifest itself, but, you know, fun, uh, being slightly uh, reckless sometimes, taking risks and so on, right. and being creative. Yes, and being creative. And I won't speak too much about this because I'd like for people to get the book, but you give an example of a puer, and it is, I was stunned to see this and it's so wonderful to read. And you also give an example of the Senex. What is the Senex? That is the danger of a, a puer or a puella remaining, you know, the, the eternal youth. Mm -hmm. um, disillusionment starts to set in, cynicism starts to set in, because life isn't, you know, this wonderfully exciting um, <laughs> venture all the right. time. You know, there are mon mundane realities that we each of us have, have to, to deal with every day of our lives, actually. Um, and so um, the senex is the Latin for old man, and this is what can, can happen. And you see that happening with someone who... Uh, well, let's stay with the two that I, that I give some... Uh, detail on in the book. One, it was David Bowie, who we all, I think, he, he inspired so much love. And there was a collective mourning when he died. And I, although I don't know his work terribly well, I, I felt that too. I felt the world had lost, um, had lost a, a star. And I mean that in a, you know, as a, a bright, illuminating, per, a creative person. But he, he kept his poor side, but he also matured into a man. He, you know, he married. He had. He became a father. He lived in a, a sort of fairly quiet life in in Manhattan, um, uh, and went on being creative, which is a wonderful thing to happen to somebody. I mean, that is, a, and and he is a Jungian, which was a revelation to me. And I've put quite a bit of about that uh, in in the book about uh, how young and he he is. Every, every nearly everything he did was inspired by Jung and and archetypal Jungian. I mean, for instance, Ziggy Stardust is quite obviously based on what Jung calls the sisyphe, which is the union of anima animus. Uh, we all have animal animus, you know, we don't, as a female, I don't just have an animus, I also have, I have this sisyphe, this union of animal animus, and Bowie's Ziggy Sardust, because Bowie, as you recall, was an androgynous figure himself, mm -hmm. and especially in the Ziggy Stardust persona, right. and that is inspired uh, quite clearly by this um, I think it's a Gnostic term, Sisyphe. Um, and as you know, you're know, saying influenced by Gnosticism. Mm -hmm. um, somebody's going to send me an email and say I've got that wrong, but I think that's why. And he, uh, Bowie, uh, you know, managed to synthesize his creative Puella side with his, uh, with becoming a mature adult. And you see that actually in his photographs of him with Imam, his wife in, in New York. 
And the other figure that I selected to show the negative, the, you know, the narcissistic um, or negative Senex side of Jung's poor was um, Julian Assange, who had and continues to attract quite a lot of publicity. And he, we actually had him living in our block of flats for seven years. Oh, did you? Okay. Yes, he, he took refuge here. He, he was seeking asylum from the British, um, you know, law, from British law, which was trying to... Um, he was being accused of all kinds of things, but he, he, he was afraid that he would be extradited to the United States to be had up, you know, disclosing military secrets on his. I'm not. I, I don't really know. He does something called WikiLeaks, I think, and I've never had anything to do with that. But I gather it broadcasts all sorts of things, including states and military secrets. Yes. And he came, when he came here, um, I actually, the, I, I remember, can I, can I go on about this? Oh, please. Too oh, much? Yes. Okay, because this was, as you know, I'm attached, have a long attachment to The Economist. And um, when Julian arrived in our midst, all the media, well as media turned up on our doorstep. So I rang the then editor-in-chief of The Economist and said, uh, John, um, I actually caught him at Heathrow Airport. He'd just gone through passport control. And I said, John, this character has just arrived in my block of flats. Do you want me to try and get an interview for The Economist? And he said, absolutely. He said, I've just come through passport control. And there's a big picture of him saying, contact the police if you see this man. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> so I tried. And... Um, the security guard on my block and I are very, very close friends and he, we, all, we both tried to get a, uh, Julian to do an interview with me. But the economists have always been so, um, you know, rude about him, calling him narcissistic and so on, which mm -hmm. actually they happen to be quite accurate. <laughs> <laughs> and so he 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 wouldn't say he wouldn't ever give me an interview, but he he was very much a part of our lives here for as I say for seven years. Mm -hmm. And he when he emerged finally he looked yeah. he was a very fresh faced young man when he first arrived, and when he was dragged out by the police seven years later he turned into an old man. Yes, I noticed that. Yeah, it was really quite quite shocking. So everybody uh, interested can read about that in Chapter 7 of the book, Jung, An Introduction. It is in the chapter titled Puer Puella versus Narcissism. And in the interest of time, I am going to uh, skip over. Chapter 8 is on the self, Chapter 9 on the numinous, and then chapter 10 is on Jung's concept of individuation. And the only note I have is a quote by Jung that you include from Collected Works, Volume 11, paragraph 618. And that is, the masses are not changed unless the individual changes. Mm -hmm. And I posted that on Twitter and on Facebook as soon as I read it. And it got a lot of... Um, a lot of retweets and likes, mm. and uh, it spoke to people, which I felt was a very positive sign. I don't know if you'd like to say anything briefly about those chapters before we move on to psychological alchemy. Uh, I think you've said it all, but I'm very, I'm very pleased to hear that uh, what you did and and the response you got. It's um, it, it clearly speaks to a lot of people, doesn't it? You, you, I mean, this, this is, you know, Jung's gift, isn't it? That he, he does actually reach a lot of people, I think. I, I've noticed, it's been very interesting since I started this podcast, and I use social media to promote the podcast and to reach out to people and to get listeners. And as interested as people say they are in Jung, I find that when it gets down to it, which is looking at oneself, that's when people seem to, not all people, but a lot of people seem to drop away because it's just so much easier to blame things on other people, 
on things, on places, on institutions, instead of looking at oneself. And uh, so it's not been very popular. And I was told that when I was in analysis, um, my analyst would tell me, you know, this is, this is not, this does not appeal to the masses. So I was very glad when um, this quote got the attention that it did. Mm -hmm. So the next chapter, chapter 11, is another one of my favorite chapters. It is titled A Critical Appraisal of C.G. Jung's Psychological Alchemy. And so many times we refer to Jung's interest in alchemy and don't preface it with the word psychological. So yes, he was interested in alchemy, but how he, he applied it psychologically. And and you bring in Sabina Spielrein and uh, transference, counter-transference. So there's a lot in this chapter. And the ox herding pictures as well. Yes, it, it's just, you know, we, again, we could spend the whole of our the talk together yeah. on psychological alchemy. So I think just mentioning it is, is for me, um, I mean, each one that you've selected and you do have, a, a, you really do know yourself, you know, which, what to go for. I, I absolutely, you know, with you on, on the chapters you've selected to spend some time talking about. And this one, is the big one. Yeah. I mean, this and uh, Shadow and Anima Animus, uh, for me, but I think particularly Psychological Alchemy and Shadow are the two topics that I have devoted so much of my thinking to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I did, um, I, th I think I mentioned that in the book, um, I did uh, that, that was a presentation I did at the university in Tokyo um, it is quite a lot of these chapters are based on you know presentations or lectures I've given different parts of the world. Yes, and I like how you mention that right at the beginning of the chapter. Well, I think it's important that one always because after all, these people invite me and they pay all my expenses and so on. I think it's courteous to to include you know them in, in, um, if I'm if I'm using material that I first delivered to them and they they weren't going to publish it so I'm free to, it's the copyright mm -hmm. me so I'm free to publish that wherever mm -hmm. um, but psychological alchemy is totally fascinating um, what Jung does with that I think is is breathtakingly wonderful um, he as you know his first uh, Richard Wilhelm it was the man who actually um, uh, pointed the way by sending him that uh, Chinese alchemical text. And that, you know, it struck such a chord with Jung. That's where he's, he, for the rest of his life, he devotes to psychological alchemy. Mm -hmm. And you say that it was one of the most important contributions to 20th century psychology. That's huge. Oh, absolutely. No, that I, I was stand by that. Yes, absolutely. That and Shadow, if I had to select. Yeah, and it's hard to, to select from you because he, you know, he, he's just so immense. Yeah, there's a lot. There's so much. It's just so immense. Mm -hmm. um, so um, those, but those, if I absolutely pushed against the wall and asked to give what I think are the, the vital contributions, I would have to say those because those are the ones that I've kept coming back to. And so the following chapter, chapter 12, is titled The Notion of Transformation in Jung and Beyond. Oh, yes, yes, that one. That also I, was a presentation I actually gave at the Beyond in Boston conference, um, which was um, which was rather rather good. I, I, I wouldn't say it was absolutely wonderful. I, 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 with Beyond, um, um, uh, I, 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 I I, I kind of was very drawn to him for a while. I, th I think I'm a little bit the other side of my fascination with him. But mm -hmm. um, uh, but I was struck, really, I was brought to Beyond by, um, I think he's Belgian, a, a Belgian Beyondist called Rudy Vermont, 
who I went to hear speaking at a Bionian conference in London many years ago. He was excellent. He was absolutely superb. And what he was doing was he was focusing what's so important in Beyond. I, I'm sure you know all this already, but Beyond in his early uh, psychoanalytic work is, you know, talking about projective identification. He's a, he's a post-Kleinian. Um, so all this is acceptable to the British psychoanalytical uh, society. And then later in his life, he starts talking about, oh, transformations and oh. Mm -hmm. And this struck me from what Rudy was saying as being very close or having a real kinship with what Jung is getting at, you know, with his notions of self and God image and so on, right? So I started getting really interested in, in late beyond. And, that, and, I, and I've been wanting for some time. I, I talked with Rudy Vermont to see if we might do something together because I like to. Again, he's someone who speaks and writes with great clarity about extremely complex mm -hmm. um, issues, mm -hmm. which I like a lot. And then at the Beyond conference, and and also the other uh, Beyond, and I got really, really close to was uh, Jim Grostein in Los Angeles. And when I was in Los Angeles, I spent some time with Jim. And I, I was asked by the Journal of Analytical Psychology to contribute to his obituary for the journal, because, of course, he was a towering figure, you know, once, once he died. Uh, he, he, was, uh, he was very uh, wonderful to be with in all kinds of ways. But um, um, Jim Rothstein had, had a tremendous, uh, I would say, transference on to anyone who came from India. And as I admit in the book, I am British Indian. I, mm -hmm. I do actually say that uh, that's my identity whenever I introduce myself in any public way. Um, and so Jim, be as you probably know, also has my background. He, he, he comes from, he's British Indian. And so Jim and I got quite close after that because Jim had this tremendous transference. Anyone who comes from India you know, <laughs> kind of was an elevated being for Jim. Uh, he had a huge unresolved transference on to Beyond. He had actually had a psychoanalysis with Beyond and Beyond oh, okay. working in Los Angeles. Uh, and he told me a wonderful story, but I don't think we have time for it because this is Beyond rather than Jung. So I won't disclose it, but it was a fascinating story about what happened. It doesn't reflect terribly well on the British society, so perhaps I won't say any more. Ah, okay. Sure. <laughs> but maybe I'll tell you when we, if, if we ever meet or when we have a private conversation, because it's, very, it's also very funny. Oh, I look forward to that. Yeah. So moving on to chapter 13, it is on Jung's transmutation, Siegfried to Parsifal. And I had asked you in our previous episode about your book, Carl Gustav Jung, which was, which was published in 2001. I had pointed out that that was before the publication of the Red Book. Well, this chapter, you say, is based largely on Jung's Red Book in its assertion that Jung's quest for his soul, as he expresses it in that work, is actually the quest for the grail. Hmm. Yeah, I, I, and I substantiate it, I hope, reasonably well with um, quotations from from the book and from, I took from someone I know, I knew rather, because he's died about a year ago, and, and I've, it's a great loss to philosophy, and that's Brian McGee, great loss to philosophy and opera. Um, Brian used to write wonderfully on philosophy and on Wagner, and Wagner is... Uh, Wagner's up there with the gods, as far as I'm concerned. And so I took from Brian's, um, Brian's uh, uh, description of um, Parsifal that Wagner himself used, um, and I give that in full, and I got, I got permission to do that. Um, and so 
I take from the Red Book, um, uh, you know, examples of where I see Jung. Um, it, it seems to me he starts off quite early in the Red Book where he's uh, talking about that vision dream. It, it, he's not sure whether it's a vision or a dream, you know, the one where he kills Siegfried, the shocking, that shocking thing that happens. And he, he, I mean, he, he, he has to understand why he's done that. And actually, it seems to me the whole of the Red Book is about this transmutation from his identification with this blonde uh, Teutonic Siegfried uh, and, and the transmutation to Parsifal. Um, and so I hope I've made a, a case for that. I gave that as a presentation at the Vienna Congress in 2019, I think. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And in an addendum to this chapter, you mentioned something that Michael Fordham said about his final meeting with Jung before Jung's death. I don't know if you want to do talk about that or save that for the reader. I think let's leave that. It, okay. It's it's rather sad, and uh, Michael. Um, I, I, no, I, I think I'll leave that because okay. it's, it's, we don't want necessarily bring in terribly sad things about Jung. Sure, sure, sure. <laughs> Unless we have to. All right, right. And then the following chapter is on Jung's wife Emma Jung, who, and it's titled Emma Jung's Percival. Yes. And she spent 30 years of her life researching the Parsifal legend. And she started to recount it in a book entitled The Grail Legend, but she was unable to finish it before her death in 1955. So Jung asked his close associate, Marie-Louise von Franz, to complete the work in order for it to be published. And it was, it was published as a book called The Grail Legend, and I will provide a link to that in the show notes. So is there anything you would like to say about Emma Jung? Um, no, I, 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 I have tremendous respect and tremendous, tremendously warm feelings about her. I didn't meet her. Um, I, I didn't come into the Jungian world until just after Jung's death, actually. But so, and she died a few years before him, as you mentioned. And just, um, I, 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 I've really grown my respect and, 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 and I always say love for her has grown as time goes by. I see just what a, um, what a, what a wonderful wife she had in Emma and what a wonderful woman she was in her own right and how intellectual she was, which came, comes as a surprise, I think, to a lot of people. You know, she taught herself fluent French so she could read that in French. Um, she spent some time, I think, in Paris when she was young. Um, and she taught herself mathematics, which I think is a great achievement for anyone. Um, she, she was such a, such a splendid, splendid person. Mm -hmm. She raised five children and she was, of course, Jung's wife. And she became an analyst as well. And she saw patients, right? Yes, in those times, um, I mean, don't forget the, you know, the training, the Jungian trainings don't actually start till after the Second World War. There aren't any formal trainings. And, you know, the um, C.G. Jung um, training in, in Switzerland and in Zurich and the Society of Analytical Psychology, SAP training in London, start around 1946. They, they vie with each other, so which came first. And, um, so, you know, until then, you became an analyst if you said you were, and, and this is how it was. And, you know, there, there weren't formal trainings for it. Right. right, right, I love that. And it is followed by chapter 15, titled Eminent Women in Analytical Psychology. And you mentioned three towns, Zurich, New York, and Cape Town. Mm -hmm. And yeah. yeah, so what prompted you to, to write this chapter uh, naming these w wonderful women? Um, 
I, I, because for each one, I, I only knew one of, I only know, I should say, one of them, but, and, I'm, and, and I have, a, and I know her quite well, and I'm, I have tremendous, tremendous liking and respect for, and that's Verena, who is the last one I mentioned, uh, from, from uh, Switzerland, of course. And, um, I'd heard, uh, so much about Yolanda Jacobi, the first one that I write about, who is actually uh, Viennese originally, as I think I say in the, uh, the piece on her. Um, I, I wanted to show how much uh, these extraordinary women and many women since then had contributed to, you know, to, to uh, the development of analytical psychology. Yes. And then it's followed by a chapter titled Major Original Figures in Analytical Psychology. And then it, that's followed by Distinguished Figures in the Contemporary Jungian World, which is uh, broken up into two chapters. Mm -hmm. And then chapter 19 is titled Philosophical, Psychological, and Scientific Influences on Jung's Thinking. And I found that to be very interesting chapter because you bring it all together. Oh, thank you. I'm so glad you think that. Um, I, you know, again, I wanted to show the breadth of of his um, of his knowledge. Yes. Uh, you know, and this is he. He's he's uh, he's all the time trying to broaden that, isn't he? And he, you know, he's he's clearly. Um, <laughs> Uh, he, he's quite extraordinary in that way. He, you know, he has a questing mind. Mm -hmm. um, and so I want, you know, it's, he's not just taking from science, he's also taking so much from philosophy, so much from philosophy, right. actually. Um, I, I, I want to just give a taste of, you know, how, how much has gone into what we call analytical psychology into Jung's you know, brainchild. Mm -hmm. And then in the last chapter, uh, which is titled Orient, you talk about the work you're doing today. And yes. I would like for you to share with us uh, what that is, the work that you're doing with the Chinese and with the Garden of the Heart and Souls work on the coronavirus outbreak in 2020. Oh golly! Um, China has taken over my life. I, I I can quite understand now why people who go there and work there for a while just you know they just they, they lose their hearts to China. Um, so much of my work now, I'm in touch with China several times a week. I, I'm you know, doing analysis, supervision, and also lecturing and teaching. Um, obviously, mostly through interpreters. Some of the Chinese have very good English. Um, Heyong and uh, Heyong and Gaolan Shen uh, are, were my gateways, really, to China. I've, I've been friends with them for many, many years. And eventually, they said to me, We'd love you to come, you know, and do some teaching in Shanghai or Shanghai, as they pronounce it. It's interesting in Chinese. I'm learning bits of Chinese pronunciation. I can't say I'm learning the language because obviously that would be totally beyond my uh, capacity because you know it's a totally different language to to any that we're used to. Um, uh, and, and well, you know, it would, would take years and years and years. But um, and at my stage, I don't have that time available to me. But I'm learning bits of pronunciation. And for instance, in Chinese, it is, what's so no, markedly noticeable is that they don't emphasize the ing sound. So, for instance, they say Shanghai. So, Heyong, who's very typical Shanghai man, he's so tall, and that's a, you know, they're different physiognomies from different parts of China and different physical builds from different parts of China, which uh, slowly I'm getting to know these things, and all of it is uh, fascinating for me. Mm -hmm. And I'm back, what, what's so wonderful for me is that I'm back in Asia because that's where I originate, yes. a, visibly a totally different part of Asia. Mm -hmm. I, I thought 
I mean, for many years now, sort of 25 or more years, I've been going back and forth with Japan. Um, and it never occurred to me until until Heyong um, and, and Gaolan said, do come and, you know, teach in China, in, China, in Shanghai. Um, it, it never occurred to me that I would, you know, become so immersed in China. And if I might add a personal thing yes. here, my father, who was an architect um, before the Second World War and then had to, of course, you know, go and fight and become an officer and fight. He, before the Second World War, he spent some time in Shanghai and he did little bits of architecture there, which is rather wonderful. Oh. So for me to go to Shanghai was a tiny bit of a pilgrimage in a way. Um, and also he always said that was his favorite city in the whole world. Oh, interesting. Uh, and when I got there, I could see why, because there are bits of like the French, what do they call it? The French, not French quarter, but. Anyway, the, 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 the French part is still intact. There's not much, I think, of the British part, um, little bits, but it, it's very fascinating. But my really what I've grown to love so much is Beijing itself. It is an absolute knockout. And so where are you teaching and who are you teaching? Um, well, I'm doing... Um, for some years now, I've been doing a weekly group supervision, and that's a whole range of people come there, and you know, and it fluctuates. It's it's a lovely group, but interesting enough, someone from Taipei is on that group, um, and he has taught me quite a bit about the history of Taiwan. Um, uh, you know, and Chiang Kai-shek went over in 1949, uh, um, which was when, you know, the end of the Nationalists and the Communist War, the Civil War in China. And so Chiang Kai-shek was the leader of the Nationalists, and he took his uh, Nationalist army with him to Taiwan. And I've been taught a bit about what ensued after that which is very interesting. So I do weekly supervision, which is very, very interesting to do. As you can imagine, we have a range. I mean, there, there's quite a bit of training now going on. The IAP are invested in the, the first bit of work I did was for the IAP developing group. Mm -hmm. uh, that Heyong, of course, Heyong actually is, you know, he, he's, He's just incredible what he's done in China uh, for Jungian psychoanalysis. Um, he's the pioneer there. Um, and so I do a weekly supervision group which fluctuates in numbers because, you know, they come and go and it's very interesting and then they come back again and um, there's that. Then I do, you know, personal supervision and then I, I also do analysis some of it with an interpreter and some of it without. Mm. And then I lecture and teach at the Oriental Academy of Analytical Psychology. Um, and I'm at the moment just putting together some seminars on ethics for, for the Oriental Academy. So this is relatively new, uh, bringing analytical psychology to the Orient. I know that you say in the conclusion that Jung would doubtless have been delighted to see analytical psychology being so well received in China. Yes, I, 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 I very much, and particularly I think because of psychological alchemy. Um, just a little footnote there. Um, I'm being tutored by a Chinese scholar in London on Chinese history and philosophy. And one thing he's made clear to me was that although, yes, Jung was very drawn to China, he, his real love in Asia, of course, was India. Um, mm -hmm. and as we know, I'm sure when I, I, that's where I come from actually, but when Jung himself arrived, in fact, in my, uh, India is my motherland, yeah. it's, it, it, that's, that's, that's where I come from. But when Jung arrived in my home city, which is Bombay, mm -hmm. <laughs> in, uh, before the 
Second World War. Um, he, I, I mean, he suddenly was confronted with the reality of India. I think up to then he'd had a rather idealized picture mm. in his mind of India, you know, full of gurus and wise <laughs> men and people searching for uh, nirvana or religious right. truth. You know, but I mean, the reality of India, of course, is not that. Mm -hmm. um, it hits you in all your senses. You know, I come from there, so you know, I was, I kind of grew up with that. Um, and and lepers on the streets, and right. death is an everyday occurrence on the streets because you know, the Indian burials are very public affairs. Mm -hmm. um, so I was very used to seeing corpses and lepers and. Um, beggars all the time, people sleeping on the, on the pavements because people live literally on the streets. Yes. That is the reality of, of India. I mean, the Chinese, they don't know that I come from India. They will if they read my book now. But um, the, even the Chinese, I hear them saying, oh, you know, India is a dangerous place to go because it's full of disease. <laughs> Um, and it, 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 because I grew up there, um, I did have one very serious illness, but on the whole, you know, as I've said several times, if you survive a childhood in India, it sets you up for life. Mm. And I think Jung suddenly confronted with the reality of this incredible, incredible nation. Um, it knocked him sideways. He was very ill. You know, he had, I think, a mere big dysentery, if I'm right. Anyway, he was very ill and it had to be hospitalized in Calcutta. As we come to the end of our time together today, is there anything additional you would like to add? Oh, as usual, I think you've covered the waterfront, Laura. I mean, <laughs> okay. you really are. You're, you're, you're such a... Such a um, stimulating person to interact with because you know so much and you're so sensitive in, in you know, asking intelligent questions. So thank you very much for having me back. I'm sorry if I talk too much. Which I, oh, rather... not at all. I love speaking with you. I love hearing your stories and I wish we could talk more and hopefully with these other books in the works, you will come back and we could have uh, some more conversations. Right, can I just say one last thing, Please. which is something you mentioned a little bit earlier, you know, that I knew, and I certainly did, uh, James Hillman, um, Michael Fordham, Gerhard Adler, people like that. I was so fortunate to come into the Union world when I did, you know, in the early 60s. They were all there, and that, that was a really incredible experience to, to actually you know, interact with these people who had had close relations with both uh, Jung and with Emma Jung. Uh, that, that was an incredible experience. Yes, I can imagine, and that's why uh, I love speaking with you because you knew them and were influenced by them and were there for it. And, um, and so thank you for writing. Thank you for taking the time to write because it's very important that we get your story. And um, so I thank you again for joining us today. Please visit the website, Speaking of Jung, that's J-U-N-G dot com for more information on everything that was discussed in this episode. There you will also find all of the previous episodes of this podcast, which are available to stream or to download for free. This podcast is also available on Apple and Google Podcasts, Spotify, and Amazon Music. And it will be available later in the week on our YouTube channel, Jungi and Laura. You can also listen to this episode on your Amazon Echo device, simply by saying, Alexa, play speaking of Jung on Apple Podcasts. Just be sure to pronounce Jung with a hard J. Links to Amazon's new Echo devices can be found in the show notes. So with special thanks to Kate Pierce and everyone at Phoenix Publishing, this is Laura London, and you've been listening to Speaking of Jung.